and chapter 20, sorry, not to Matthew, I think fine. We want Matthew as well, but we're going to read from Luke chapter 23. To get down like this, I think, to see it. <laughs> Well, we read from Luke 23, and I'm going to read from verse 26. The word of God says, as they led him away, that's Jesus, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the womb, wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? To other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, Peace saved others. Let him save himself as he's the Christ of God. The chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung them hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished, punished justly, for you are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And then I just want to read from Matthew 27. And you have to find verse 38. In mine, it's in the middle of a chunky paragraph. We'll go from verse 37, actually. Above his head, they place the written charge against him. This is Jesus. The king of the Jews, two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who first passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy this temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. We will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Keep hold of those words in the last verse there. The robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Think of the best of times and the worst of times. If I think of the worst of times, there's many things I can tell you, many experiences in my life that I would say, well, they were amongst the worst of times, the worst of experiences. But one that came to mind when I was thinking on this was when I was about a dozen years old, that makes me about 12, and I and some other boys got caught shoplifting in Devonhams. 
And we were told, we were taken into this office and we were told that they would be writing to our parents and that we were to go home and that we were to tell our parents what we had done. None of us did. I was actually staying at my grand's uh, that weekend. And at my grand's that weekend, I was most silent, most depressed and just felt sick and totally and utterly miserable. When I went back home uh, to my father's house and to my stepmother's house, so to speak, um, well, the Monday, she, uh, my father's second wife, he, she had a hairdresser's and we lived above it. And on the Monday, I looked out the window and below there was this uh, um, uh, place for parking cars to park on the road. And there was a row of shops on either side and a police car came and pulled up right outside the hairdressers. The worst of times, the worst of times. I truly thought well, that was the police coming for me. That was the police coming at the very least to tell uh, my father's wife what I'd been up to and so forth. Uh, thankfully it wasn't. But that was one of the worst of times. Well, the best of times. The best of times. Again, if you think in your own life, uh, the best of times, what would you say if you were asked to come now and speak of the best of times? Uh, many people would speak of uh, a wedding day, of uh, maybe uh, the time of uh, the birth of their first child, or uh, many would want to say the best of times, because it was such a powerful experience, was the day I came to the Lord. For me, I, I can say many of those things and agree with many of those things, but let me choose something slightly different. And say so one of the times that stand out as being amongst the best of times was actually when I was called by the Lord to come here to take over from Paul, who was retiring. It was one of the best of times uh, because for many long years I sensed a call into ministry and yet door after door seemed to be closed. And then there was this letter from you <laughs> saying, we believe the Lord is calling you to, uh, to take over the pastorate. And uh, I read it and I was at work and I went into the toilets. I actually knelt down. Then my mother floor was dirty. And I actually knelt down and, and gave thanks to the Lord. And I think it was quite a tearful giving and thanks. And then just the whole experience of how I came here was a tremendous, the best of times. Because the church couldn't afford to pay a salary or anything like that. And yet, by faith and by prayer, we watched as door after door opened. This is the way. Go through it. Go through it. Go through it. And we've been effectively together going through them ever since. And so we, we give thanks. The, the best of times. What I want us to consider this morning. The worst of times. The best of times. The best of times. The worst of times. We have here uh, some headings. The worst of evil. The worst of Christ, the best of faith. Think of those as three headings. I've got a four, which we'll come to. But think of the worst of times and the best of times. But here, the best of times are faithful times. The best of faith. Let's look. The worst of evil. Imagine that, you know, you introduce yourself to someone, what's your name, what's their name, and then one of the next questions that follow is, uh, well, the next question that follow is, what do you do? And what they mean by that, what do you do for a living? What do you do, what line of work are you in? Imagine saying this, what do you do? I'm an evil worker. I work evil. I'm an evil worker. Our reading in Luke, these criminals, that word criminals is literally evil worker. There's evil workers. And these two men are evil workers. And they're evil such as it be. So atrocious, probably right from a young age, no doubt, criminal mindset. Called in another place robbers. So they would take off other people not caring for leaving them completely destitute. They would steal and uh, it was for them and it was self-satisfaction, self-gratification. Me, me, me. Because they're evil workers, but they're evil. And their work has brought them now to the point of death. And here they are, they're facing death. 
at the point of death, when someone knows death is coming, death is approaching, what often happens? What often happens is evil rips. And what you want to do then is you want to clear your conscience. Because, you see, the Bible tells us that eternity is written into the heart of man. That includes woman. Humanity. Every one of us. And when death is knocking at the door, so to speak, suddenly fear grips because there's a sense of, but well, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? I'm going to enter into this eternity. And I'm not ready for it. And one of the things that people try to do then is to put it right, to put things right. But generally what you find is it's fear that's the motive, not remorse. There's sorrow that now they're going to face the consequences, but not genuine remorse of the hurt that they've done. That's often the case. That's not repentance, is it? That's just feeling sorry for yourself and fearful. Fear is the motive. But not here. Not here. What you see here, these two men, either side of the Lord Jesus Christ, surely they must be in agony. They've suffered, possibly, maybe not as brutally as the Lord has suffered, but having nails driven in, and no doubt they've probably been scourged for their crimes and so forth. So they've suffered tremendously physically. But what you don't experience in the writing, these two passages that we've read, it doesn't describe their agony. What it describes is the foulness coming out of their mouths. What we read there is that they heaped insults. They hurled abuse at the man who was in the middle. Never mind their own pain and suffering. They hurled abuse at the Lord Jesus Christ. Precious Savior. Yeah, they were abusing, hurling him. Hurling abuse at him. Why? Why would they do that? Well, because they're evil workers. They're evil workers. And that's what evil does. I wonder if we could compare uh, their works. We're not told what they actually did. But if there was a, a list of the charge or the charges that was leading to their death, what would be top of the list? What would be second? What would be third? What would be least important of the charges against them? I tell you, the one that they are most guilty of, the severest one, the worst one, the worst of their evil work is not something that's put them on the cross. It's what they're doing while they're on the cross. It's the abuse of the Son of God. That's the worst crime they could commit. And they freely do it. Hurling abuse. Heaping abuse. Light has come into the world. We've been considering that recently with uh, celebrating Christmas. The dawn of Christ coming in. Light came into the world. Joy to the world. Light has come. But evil works. Evil. All evil. Doesn't like the light. Loves the darkness. What about their own plans? Shouldn't they be concerned for their situation? No, you see, they, they have such an evil heart that at this point in time, they've got no regard for their own situation. They're only concerned of hurling abuse at the beautiful one who's in the midst, in the middle. And what is more, what is more, they're not alone with that. They're not alone with that. They're joined by all those who are surrounding. Evil workers, no regard for themselves. It's the worst of times for them. They're going to die. They're dying. It's the worst of times for them. And yet what they display is the worst of evil. By hurling abuse at the Son of God. Why? What, is, what has Jesus done to, to deserve this? He's come and he's come to bring in the kingdom of God. He's come to usher that in. He's come to teach the ways of God more clearly, we might say. But they've not followed. If they've heard any of that teaching, they've not followed that teaching. They don't want that teaching. They don't want anything to do with him. Why? 
because they're darkness and he's light and light darkness hates the light and so therefore they hate him again this is evil at work this is darkness before light at work the lord jesus christ it looks doesn't it reading this imagine you've never read it before and we just read this account this morning or, or you've been reading through matthew's gospel or one of the other gospels and you've been marveling at what jesus has been doing and saying but but now what's happened what's happened light that jesus came to bring jesus is the light but the light has been overcome that's what it appears. Light has been overcome. Light now, this man who said he comes from God, he's been beaten up. He's been nailed to a cross. He's been mocked. He's got a mocking crown of thorns on his head, so to speak. He's naked on a cross. <laughs> he's beaten. If he was just an ordinary man, by the side of him, and even in the crowd, they'd have left him to it. That are left into his own suffering. But you see, he's not a And something within these men who are darkness, who are evil workers, something within these men stirred, eternity written into the heart of man, yes, but also sons of darkness. Evil is at work. Even the devil is at work. Motivating, stirring them to rage against the light. This is a demonic time, and it's not just these two men. The worst of evil here is not just in them. It's all those who are there. The passers-by are hurling abuse. Hurling abuse. Not of the two criminals. They might mock them a little bit, as people do. But the one they're really concerned to abuse the one they hate is the one in the middle. Evil is at work. Not just in those two criminals, but in all the people gathered around. This is the worst of times, and it's the worst of evil. But then secondly, it's the worst of Christ. What is on display here? Now, bear with me in this before you throw me out. What is on display here is the worst of Christ. The worst of Christ. You see, put yourself in the shoes of those who were around him, those in Jerusalem at that time. Even his own disciples, they were looking for a king. Like the great David, mighty warrior, Samson, who would conquer all their enemies. And at this time, the big enemy was Rome. Rid them of Rome, rid them of the yoke of Rome, and set them free. And the nation Israel would begin to reign triumphantly with Messiah as king in the line of David. A king who would conquer. But, but this king, what does he do? He comes into Jerusalem. He enters Jerusalem, not at the head of a mighty arm, but with a few fishermen and riding on a donkey, which is actually fulfilled a prophecy, but they don't see it. Riding on a donkey. He spoke against the religious authorities. He made great claims about the temple. <laughs> but now look, now look. He's beaten and bloody. See him suffering. He couldn't even carry his own cross. Someone had to carry it for him. Where now? Putting myself in the shoes of those gathered around in this unbelief and these evil workers. Where now are your miracles? No one ever spoke like you did, huh? What of your speech now? No one ever spoke. His hearers. Oh, there were those who would follow him. They would forsake all to follow him. 
<laughs> but, but now look, it's the worst of times. And all his hope is gone, fled. Like those disciples, like those followers. Where, where are they? Look around. Can you see any of them? No, I can't see any of them. Man is weak. It's all over. This is the worst of Christ. Now, I could play that out more because it's important to get the idea that I'm coming to now. Think of Christ without your wanting to sort of tear at me and say, how dare you speak of him like that and weakness and so forth. He was in weakness. And if you don't didn't know the outcome, you didn't know the end, as it were, you didn't really understand what he was doing, you would say, well, there's a beaten man. You were just someone who was traveling through. And you know, there's a crucifixion today, which obviously was fairly common in Roman times. A crucifixion today, and you went over to look because people like to see these kinds of things. You, well, there's a man who's had it, and three men, in fact, hopeless, hopeless, no hope, finished, finished. The worst of times, the worst of Christ, he who claimed to be Christ. But then thirdly, this brings in the best of faith. Because in our main reading, in Luke, one of those disciples, sorry, one of those disciples, one of those criminals, one of those evil, because one of those robbers, yeah, I guess what happens is they're both nailed to the cross their crosses at the same sort of time. And there's so much excitement and so much going on and slander and abuse being hurled at the Lord Jesus Christ. And they join in too. We read that in Matthew. They join in too. But then things kind of calm down a little bit. Things die down a little bit. A little bit of time passes. I don't know how long. But left to his own thoughts and left to perhaps his own pain, I'm sure. One of those evil one of those thieves on the cross suddenly starts to be overcome with a, a different sensation, a sense of remorse. And this genuine remorse, not that what we were talking about before, uh, of fear that where you say, oh, I'm sorry for what I've done. I want to put this right because it's just fear. No, this is genuine remorse coming over him. The thought that he's been all his life an evil work. He now would call himself the most wicked of men. And this must come upon him with such a power as to be greater, a greater sensation than the pain. Think of that. Think of that. First of all, the evil that was upon these two men must have been greater than the pain. But they were totally taken up with that. But now this one man, that's gone. And suddenly he's taken up with something else. This sense of guilt, this sense of remorse. And it's so powerful. I don't want to say it's to numb them, but it's greater than that. And then a, a soldier. A soldier comes up. Let me let me read it to you again in verse 38. Uh, verse, verse 38. 36, sorry. The soldiers come up and they, they mock him. And one offers him wine vinegar. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And what, what you read there, there's this written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the thieves... Perhaps he sees that notice there. This is the king of the Jews. And he starts to, as it says next, verse 39, one of the criminals hurled insults at him. Well, let me put in there more insults, yet more insults. But not the other. The other criminal rebuked him. He rebuked him. He turns on him and he turns on himself as well. He condemns him for what he's saying, and he condemns himself with the same sentence. He says, don't you fear God, since we are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. That's 
that's a tremendous statement, isn't it? That's a tremendous statement. The fact that he turns on himself, the fact that he condemns himself is a key ingredient in repentance. Self-condemnation. I have done and I deserve. And true repentance doesn't want to run from the consequences. True repentance says, I deserve it and I'm ready to receive it. I'm ready to receive my punishment. That is a key ingredient in repentance. You ever experience that? Can you stand uh, before the Lord in prayer and, and, and declare to him what you deserve for your sin? If you can only say, thank you that my sin's forgiven, but don't see that actually you don't deserve forgiveness, and what you deserve is the consequences of your sin, is his wrath and judgment, then that's not really true repentance. Because a key ingredient is that you have that self-condemnation. You're ready to say, I have done and I deserve. Ah, but then you see, there's this wonderful thing called grace, isn't there? That the one who says, I have done and I have deserve and I deserve, will receive blessing upon blessing, but will come to that. Have you done it? Have you come to him in repentance? At the worst of times, we see the best of faith. You see, us here, we, we have the Bible and we have uh, books on theology and so forth. We uh, can use the internet as well. And we can understand, to a measure, we can understand about the being of God. We can look and we can see uh, how majestic he is and so forth. Uh, we can look into great truths about, and so we can grow in our understanding of them. We can say, as I once did before I was a Christian, for God to be God, never mind all this Greek mythology stuff, for God to be God, he has to be the creator. He has to be the creator of all things. And when you see that, the next thing is to say, well, hang on, if he's the creator of all things and he's truly God, the next step is to say, he either controls all things or he doesn't control anything at all. If he doesn't control anything at all, then there's no point bothering with it. Not worth bothering with such a God. But if he controls all things, this is the one I need. This is the one I need. And you read your Bible and you see his works and you see he does control all things. He is sovereign over all. You read your Bible. You see what God has done. You see the greatness of God. Something of the greatness of God anyway. And what do you find? You find, as the Westminster Catechism puts it, you find this, that God is a spirit. Infinite. Eternal. And unchanging. In his being, his wisdom, his power, his holiness, his justice, and his truth. All these great truths scripture declares. And though you or I, left to our own devices, might not be able to put it quite so clear as that, we'll get all those headings that I've just put there. It's come from a catechism. We, when we hear it, yeah, that's what I believe. That's what I believe. That's what I read in uh, Psalms. That's what I read here. That's what I read there. We see these things. What am I getting at? Well, let me push it on. The Lord Jesus Christ. We can read of his miracles. We can hear his teaching. I've already quoted that man who came to arrest him and didn't and came back and said, no one has spoken of this man to us. Such wisdom. Such authority. We can read these things. We can see and understand that, that God sent him into this world. And that not only that, that actually the Lord Jesus Christ, what John tells us is that he's the word of God. That in the beginning was the word. And that the word was with God. And the word was God. So we can learn that Jesus is the son of God. He's God the son. We consider these things. We consider what he came to do. Christ Jesus, what? He came into the world. What did he come into the world to do? 
to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We can see these things and we can learn and we can understand that we must come to him for salvation. That we must come because we're sinners. We've fallen short of the glory of God and we must come to him for salvation. That the atoning work is done. Done is the work that saves. Once and forever, what, once and forever done. Where's it done? We, we sung it, it's on the cross. The atoning work is done on the cross. Now, you've heard that here many, many times. You read it in the word many, many times. You see these things. Do you believe these things? Hallelujah, if you do. And if you don't, why not? You must. You must. And when you do, what do you want to say as we sung in one of the hymns? How great thou art! How great thou art! Oh, then sings my soul. Because joy fills the heart of the one who's seen and believes. Now, in that context, I want to say, isn't it easy to believe? Because you see your own heart, you see you're, you're an evil worker. And you need a saviour, you need someone to take away your sin. And you see that Jesus came into the world to do just that. And that all you've got to do is believe in him. It's so simple, it's so wonderful. It's so lovely that he's taken all my punishment, he's taken all my suffering. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, relief. And in a sense, it, it, it's so easy. Such a simple message, isn't it? I'm a sinner, I need a saviour to be reconciled to God. Jesus came to save sinners. Believe in him, you will be saved. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Can I be baptized now? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> simple. Simple. Okay. Now, consider this. Consider you're the thief on the cross. The victim's blood has been shed. People are saying, come down now from the cross. If you are the son of God, come down now. We're believing you. <laughs> He, he saved others, he can't save himself. <laughs> what an idiot he is up there. I shouldn't say that word, even in, 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 um, in, in trying to take on that mocking to because I don't like things like that. But just to give the scripture, so forgive me, Lord. But you, you get the point. He's weak, Christ in weakness. It's the worst of Christ that is being seen. His miracles, his teaching, where are they now? Where's that now? Christ is at his weakest. It's the worst of times. We sung it at Christmas. Hands, now, hands almighty, now lie helpless. Hands almighty, now lie helpless. It's the worst of times. Christ is at his weakest. Who would believe that a man who's dying on a cross it's all up. It's all over. Where's his followers? It's all gone. Game's up. It's finished. Who's going to believe in him? Behold! Behold! What do we read? What do we see? We see the best of faith. He turns to Jesus. It's man, his thief, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Isn't that just tremendous? Isn't that just such a statement? It's the worst of times. Christ is at his weakest. Now, now, here's a man. Behold, behold, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This thief, as we'll call him, takes a, a giant leap of faith and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And trusting in him. It's great faith, isn't it? The worst of times, what we see is the best of faith. Think of the centurion comes afterwards. The centurion, he, he sees an earthquake when Jesus dies. And he sees the manner in which Jesus dies. And then he says, Surely this was the son of God. And, and we say, isn't that remarkable? Remarkable that one who isn't even a, a, a Jew would, would, would say and see such and say such a thing. But here, there's been no earth. Here, when this man turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom, there's no evidence 
of what is yet to be. It's just a man. An ordinary man, isn't it? In the middle. In weakness. Yet. Yet. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What faith. What faith indeed. Hands of almighty, now thy hands. But here is a man in the worst of times, displays the best of faith, and he receives faith, receives rich reward. Jesus answered him in verse 43, if I can see it. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. How about that? How about that, eh? You belong to Jesus, are you his? Well, maybe it wasn't easy for you to come to him. Uh, our brother Jeff often says how he was always running away from Jesus, and many of us say we were doing that, we were running away from him, because that's true of us. But when you think about it, it's, it's relatively easy to believe, because it makes so much sense. You can't look at this world and say, it got here by itself, there was some kind of explosion, and now here it is, and so forth, and there's no God. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Doesn't make any sense at all. But what the Bible says, oh, it makes great sense. And I want to put again, it's easy to believe when you're uh, in need, as it were, and you see these things, how easy it is to believe and come to him. Here's a man. When we see faith, well, sorry, when we see Christ at his weakest, and yet believes in him. He's learned on his own cross. The, the greatest lesson and by faith he believes when God appears to be in weakness it's actually a display of strength it turns the world upside down God willing we'll go to that passage in Acts next Sunday the world turned upside down it turns your world upside down when by faith you believe the sight of God in weakness is actually a display of his strength. And ourselves, by faith, realizing what I once thought was my strength, actually is, is futile. And I see, begin to see something of how weak I am. And I see Christ crucified, seemingly in weakness, but actually displaying the greatest strength. When I grasp hold of that by faith, what a great lesson. What a wonderful truth to behold. It's not till we see ourselves in the worst of times, at our worst, it's not till we see ourselves at our worst, can we come to experience the best, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, because we need to see ourselves at our worst in order to reach out to him and say, oh Lord, receive me. Lord, take me into your life. That's salvation. Do you have it? Do you have that salvation? The weakness of God is for our strength. This so-called thief displays the best of it. What about you? Let me go to a, a fourth heading, and this is where I really want to apply this. Really, if you're not a Christian, you need to come to the Lord. You need to be saved. But now I want to apply this to those who say, well, I am a believer. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My fourth heading would be this. God alone can help. God alone can help. You see, for the believer, the question for us, every one of us here this morning, if we say that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, is how strong is your faith? How strong is your faith? At the worst of times, what do you see of faith? At the worst of times, what you need to see is the best of your faith. That's what we want for every one of us. That at the worst of times, we see the best of faith in us. What must we do in order that at the worst of times, we see the best of faith in us? Well, the thief can help us. He can help us. Because at the worst of times in our lives, when there's uncertainty, when there's a crisis in our time, in our lives, when we say to ourselves, there, there's no way out of this. I, I, I can't see the wood for the trees is what they say, isn't it? There's no way out. 
What happens then? What happens then? Think of Nehemiah. Mighty man, wasn't he? What do you think of Nehemiah? Strong, going back to Jerusalem and getting them to rebuild all the walls and uh, resisting all the opposition from all the others around and so forth. Strong man, yet yeah. not at the beginning. What you read before he went back to Jerusalem is that when he stood before the king, Artaxerxes, the one who could send him, although it's the Lord who sends, but the one he had to go to for earthly permission, let's say, what do we find? We read that he was dreadfully afraid. And so we can say, it's not sin to feel fear, to experience fear, to experience weakness. That's not sin. It's what you do next that's important. It's what you do next. It's what you do in that weakness. It's what you do in that fear. It's what you do when a crisis moment comes. You see, the crisis, crisis moment comes. And for the average Christian, all the great doctrines that you've learned and that you've recited perhaps over and over, what happens to those great doctrines? They leave your mind at the speed of light. And you're left alone. What do you do now? What do you do? At times of greatest weakness, when we are in that situation where we feel utterly alone, utterly destitute, we can't see the wood for the trees, we, we, we see no way out. There are times of our greatest weakness. We're no different to this thief on the cross. We're no different to him beholding Christ who appears to be in weakness. We're no different to him. Hopeless situation, the worst of times. Yet this man takes a leap of faith. He grasps hold, not physically, of course, he would if he could. He grasps hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. At the worst of times, he displays the best of faith. And we must do the same. We must do the same. You see, although we don't see Christ on a cross and, and not understand that he's going to be victorious and we've got to somehow accept that by faith. We can read all that. In our times of crisis, there's a sense in which we feel alone and we feel as though God has forsaken us. And it's almost as though there is no God. There's no nothing. There's just me and I'm, I'm scared. What do I do now? What do I do now? We do the same as a thief did on the cross. The best of faith. He believed that the Lord alone could help. That's what he believed. The thief on the cross effectively offered out uh, what we might call an arrow prayer. An arrow prayer. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, he said. At the worst of times, we see the best of faith, this arrow prayer. Lord, help me. Nehemiah is before the king. Why are you looking downcast and sad in my, I've never seen your complexion looking like this before. This is, this is a, a real matter of the heart. What's going on with you? You can't be like that before a, a king. You can't have a sad face. You can't have a life outside of what the king wants for your life. You can't have personality unless he calls for it. You can't do these things. Why are you smiling too much? Or why are you sad in this case? Nehemiah before the king. He's dreadfully afraid. What's he do? Arrow prayer. Arrow prayer. You read it in Nehemiah chapter 2. He prayed and then he said, it's an arrow prayer. And what about Peter? We've looked at him a lot. Peter coming out of the boat. Oh, it's great, isn't it? Till he sees the wind and the waves. And then what does he do? Arrow prayer. Lord, save me. Save me. At the worst of times, for those three men, and others I could show, but we're using those three, for those three men at the worst of times, there was nothing any of them could do. Absolutely nothing they could do about their situation, except one thing, and that's the vital thing. Faith must cry. God alone can help. God alone can help. 
That's what they must do. That's what you must do. Peter held to this. Nehemiah prayed knowing this. The thief on the cross called him in this. You alone can help. You alone can help. So let me close by, by being your spiritual doctor, as it were, this morning. And I want to say to you, take this medication continually. Take this medication at the hour, on the hour. Take this medication on the half hour. Take this medication every time the clock ticks over to another minute. Take this medication second by second, moment by moment. Take this medication. Meditate on it. Say it as a mantra to yourself, if you will. In my deepest need, God alone can help. In my deepest need, God alone can help. What's that sound? It's the sound of the ambulance. The ambulance is on its way. Crisis is here. What's happening to the doctrine that I grasp and love so dearly? Oh, look, he's preparing for flight. He's preparing for liftoff. He's going to leave my heart. It's going to leave my mind destitute. What am I to do? Am I to run around trying to chase after it? Holding on to this truth? Holding on to that truth? Do this. Go for one thing. One truth. Just go for that. Throw yourself at it. And say to it. You're not going. You're not going. If you're going, I'm going with you. God alone can do it. Hold back. God alone can do it. Our God, our help in ages past. Our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast. And our eternal home. That became a dear hymn to me when a man who was well into his 90s and his mind was gone. He was a devout Christian, but he couldn't remember much anymore. But the one thing he held to was that hymn, our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. That's about all he could get out. He was holding on to that one truth. God alone can help. God alone can help. My mind's gone. I'm dying here. I can't really pray anymore, but God alone can help. God alone can help. We're to be like, well, forgive me for this one. I really don't like sending anything up that makes me sound good or whatever. But here's the point, playing this game of paintballing and whatever, two teams. And our team's getting thrashed. We've got no points on the board whatsoever. And it comes to, I don't know if it's the penultimate round or whatever, but we're losing 50 nil or something stupid. And, and what you've got to do is you've got to get to this particular tree where this, I don't know, whatever it was now, a rag or something, yellow rag, and you've got to get hold of it and that gets you four points or some measure of points. And then if you can get it to the home base, then you get kind of the jackpot. And I thought to myself, we've got no points whatsoever. We're hopeless at this. I'm having that. I'm getting that. I may not get to the jackpot. I don't care about that. I'm just getting that. And as soon as the gun or cracker went, off I was just running as fast as I could just for that one thing. And I got it and then I got shot all over the place. And as I say, I'm not trying to send myself up here, but it's just that point. Go for the one thing. Go for the one thing. God alone can help. God alone can help. Be like Job. Job, who, not Job, Joab. Joab, who, his life was gone. Solomon was going to execute him. He was going to bring just, justice on him, and rightly so. But what did Job, Joab do? He went and took hold of the horns of the altar. No, but here I will stay. Here I will die. Hold the forms of the altar of this. God alone can. God alone can. Faith receives the richest reward. The king grants Nehemiah's request. The Lord reached out and grabbed hold of Peter, didn't he? And the thief. I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So train your mind with that statement. God alone can help. So that when you see the worst of times, you'll experience rising in your heart the best of faith. Best of faith. God alone can help. Grasp it. Hold it. Cherish it. 
Don't let it out of your sight. Follow it everywhere. Never doubt it for one moment. Have it as a mantle in your heart. God alone can help. And he will. He will. How do we know? Because he gave us his son. And the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And if he's given us his son, would he not also along with him give us all things? God alone can help. And he will help you in your worst of times. Hold on to that. Amen. Amen.